Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Chloe Valdery. Chloe Valdery is a writer and an entrepreneur. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Daily Beast, and elsewhere. She runs a company called The Theory of Enchantment, which teaches social and emotional learning in schools and diversity and inclusion in companies and government agencies. We talk about her new podcast, which involves inviting her guests to smoke weed. We talk about the difference between smoking weed and eating it. We talk about how to think about black history and historical injustice, modern rhetoric about white people. We talk about the causes of the Great Awakening, which is a term Matthew Iglesias coined, referring to the period since 2014 or so when white Democrats have become more woke on the issue of race than black people. We talk about why Black Lives Matter perceives themselves to be connected to the Israel-Palestine conflict. We talk about Chloe's unique approach to Twitter, art, and politics. We talk about the relationship between hip-hop and the Western canon. We talk about charter schools, branding, and we end the podcast by talking about why I don't buy merchandise from artists I love and why Chance the Rapper's music has gotten worse. I hope you're all doing well at whatever level of quarantine you're experiencing right now, and I hope you enjoy the podcast. Chloe Valdery, thanks for being on my podcast. Thank you for inviting me. You just started your own podcast. I did. I just started my second podcast. Yeah, I started uh, my first podcast, Theory of Enchantment, about Mm. a year and a half ago. Okay. And I started this new one, Weed and Wisdom, with Chloe recently, like a week ago. Weed and Wisdom, what's the connection between the two? So I started smoking weed when I was like 23 years old, um, just purely recreationally because my friends were doing it. And then I recognized that when I would take edibles, I had a very uh, interesting relationship with it musically and intellectually. And I thought that that experience on edibles was actually quite intellectually expansive. So Mm -hmm. I wanted to take that practice of, you know, imbibing an edible into a more regimented format and just have discussions that were interesting and had to do a lot with pop culture with famous people or interesting people in a, in a podcast format. So what's the difference between smoking weed and eating it to you? Uh, for smoking weed, it's not really, it lasts, the high lasts for about a minute, I guess. And, and so it's, if I want to have like a sustained series of thoughts that are like, intellectually interesting or musically interesting i can't really do that when i smoke weed Mm. but when i take an edible it lasts four to six hours and so i can do everything from uh produce music Mm. to just even just consume music in a way that is uh different um from my experience consuming music without it even though i think both music is a separate issue like i'm obsessed with music so either way is amazing but when i have an edible it's like that much more incredible. Mm. So. Edibles are dangerous, I found. In yeah. <laughs> I, I, one time in high school, I made weed-infused peanut butter. Oh, with wow. a friend. Yeah. Uh, when my dad wasn't home, and he came back, and the whole house smelled like weed. Oh, yeah. And Amateur then, mistake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then we went into the city to see a show, came back, missed our stop on the train because we fell asleep. Oh, yeah. I think, I'm, I, think I was okay because I... I, I started using or i started you know partaking weed marijuana at a age when my brain was more or less fully functioned mm. so i never smoked it as a teenager or anything mm. like that and i think i sort of like I, I missed out but also to my advantage i missed out on all the fun stories that would have happened if i wouldn't have uh if i wouldn't have missed out on doing it in my teenage years so let's talk about your upbringing a, l- a little bit before sure. we talk about music sure so you're from New Orleans. Mm-hmm. New Orleans or New Orleans? Uh, I say New Orleans, but either way is fine. Interesting. Okay. So what is it about... Do you think there's any connection between having grown up in New Orleans and your political views, your views on race, on Israel? Um, I think on race, probably. Not really on... Not necessarily on Israel mm-hmm. or political views mm-hmm. in general, but I think on... On, when it comes to the issue of race, uh, where race intersects with education, New Orleans is actually a very interesting city because it has schools that are both really, really of poor quality 
and schools that are really, really amazing. And it has this interesting tradition of um, being uh, one of the first cities in the country to value education for women because of its French and Catholic background. Um, but also my educational experience growing up, like I went to elementary school uh, called Langston Hughes Elementary School for about four years. My long lost yeah. cousin. Oh I'm yeah, not, I I'm actually wanted actually. to ask you if you were related to him. Somehow. I've lied and said <laughs> I have before as a joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah. usually people don't take it seriously. No, no, people they don't usually believe me. Oh, okay, okay. I don't know why they don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's weird. But it's. Um, weird. I had wondered if you were somehow related. That would awesome. be amazing. But what that educational experience did was. Um, actually quite foundational because it was very much it gave me a lot of black history mm. uh, and in doing so um, but it gave me a black history that was very much rooted in empowerment mm. and very much rooted in um, a narrative of like redemption mm. some of the first things that I had to learn in English literature classes for example in elementary school was like poetry the poetry of Langston Hughes the poetry of Maya Angelou and so these were figures who loomed large in my imagination mm. at a very very young age mm. um, and as a result like the image of black America loomed large in my imagination at a very young age and then after attending that school for a couple of years I attended a predominantly uh, mixed school, I guess you could say, uh, very international in the sense that I went to to school with people from all kinds of different backgrounds, and that's how my, you know, pre college education. That's how it was like. So mm -hmm. first, I went to a school that was predominantly black. Then I went to a school that was predominantly mixed. Then I went to high school that was predominantly black for a couple of years, and then I I graduated from a high school that was predominantly mixed. So I grew up around people of all different backgrounds. And I don't know if other people, I assume that other people don't have that experience mm -hmm. in other cities, but to the extent that that experience happened in New Orleans, it was very relevant and very foundational in, in uh, constructing my worldview. And that worldview is, I think part of what you unites us or part of, when I see your tweets, yeah, the common thread I see, in, I, I see between you and I and Camille Foster, mm -hmm. Amish Tatterton Williams is a deep commitment to the oneness of the human family. Yeah, yeah. And there are probably various disagreements, maybe big ones, uh, between a lot of those folks sure. I just mentioned. But that seems to have become such a cliche message Yeah. now to the point where it just elicits an eye roll. Does it? I mean, I don't know. I think in a lot of circles that, that I am in, it doesn't necessarily elicit that. Certainly on Twitter it does, but I'm not sure that that's really represent, representational of um, any meaningful thing, or even if it is meaningful, I don't know the extent to which it is meaningful. Mm. But to your point, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of language uh, and rhetoric in political circles um, today, for example, that are about white people that I just fundamentally can't fathom mm. because I grew up around white people mm -hmm. and and the impression that I get when I read some of these comments or just when I think about the attitude that these that people are putting out there um is something that is fundamentally foreign it's a foreign concept to me because mm. so, like I, the, the only thing I can think of when I read those things is that like these people clearly don't know white people mm. or like not, not in an intimate in an intimate setting the way mm. you would know mm -hmm. you know a friend or a family member. Mm -hmm. So it's just, yeah, I can't really, it's not that, it's not simply that I disagree with the rhetoric. It's that it's incomprehensible to me. Yeah. So I, I definitely share that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I grew up in a town that was as you, I think perhaps you did. Yeah. I don't know. Well, like your school, it was mixed. It okay. Was like yeah, yeah. Yeah. A quarter black over half white and some Hispanics and Asians. Mm -hmm. And I grew up with an intuitive sense that these divisions don't matter. Yeah. Equally at home being friends with black kids, Asian kids, right. white kids. Right. And the divisions might be funny at most, but they were not deep. They were yeah. not essential. Yeah. And so when I got to about 16 or 17 and started hearing the rhetoric about white people, um, the casual way in which being, say, a white male mm -hmm. is almost a slur. Yeah. Uh, or it's used that way. It Likewise, it just didn't register. It was, like, profoundly confusing. Yeah. Um, you started hearing that when you were 16 and 17? I did. I started hearing it before college. 
Okay. Because I went to a very progressive high school. Okay. A high school that was less diverse than uh, mm. than I had grown up with in elementary school. Okay. A private high school. And the, it was very progressive and it was an early adopter of the wave of intersectionality and sure. wokeness. What year was this? This would be in about 2012. Okay. I didn't quite... I don't, I don't think I started hearing it until 2014. Um, and mm-hmm. I think that that was sort of a product of Ferguson mm-hmm. and what was going on with Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, I, at least I didn't really hear about intersectionality mm-hmm. until 2014, but that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I wonder if there was a bigger impact on you or just a different impact on you having heard it in high school. Maybe. You know, I, I think because I got introduced to it and imbibed it and more or less believed it in mm-hmm. high school, you know, in, in, you know, kind of like a, you know, getting a shot. I was maybe immunized sure. by the time I went to college to a degree that a lot of other people weren't. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, like we were just talking with my girlfriend before yeah. from Texas has never heard any of this stuff. Yeah. And then you come to, you know, you, you come to a college on the coast and yeah. for the first time you're hearing you like, you're, you feel like you're swallowing a red pill. You're hearing about the prison industrial complex mm-hmm. and, you know, a whole litany of other things that probably your public school didn't give you at all. Yeah. And so you imbibe not only truths from that, but also falsehoods and overstatements mm-hmm. and you have no immunity against it because yeah. you, you haven't heard anything. You haven't heard the counter arguments. Right. It's like the, it's like the only thing you've heard. So you're right. used to it and you think it's a standard. And then um, you're probably told that the fact that your high school, your elementary school didn't mention such mm-hmm. things as the prison industrial complex is proof that you were feel you were like, you know, indoctrinated right. or uneducated or yeah. something like that. Yeah. But that's so interesting to me because like my response to that is like I I really did receive an incredible education in black history. Mm-hmm. You know, and I do think that there is something to be said for folks who are in school who aren't receiving any education about black history. And that is a problem. But like I received a very foundational introduction um, and in-depth exploration of black history since I was at least six years old. Mm -hmm. So so that that also that 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 um, accusation of ignorance is a, a misaccusation. Mm-hmm. It's just that I'm I'm looking at things through a different lens. Mm. It's not that the content isn't there. It's that the lens through which I understand the content is mm. totally different. Mm. I think I grew up with quite a bit of black history as well. I grew mm-hmm. up reading and memorizing the Langston Hughes poems yeah. and Maya Angelou and whatnot through the, through the school system. Right, same, um, yeah. There was recently a New York Times op-ed. I don't know if you saw this, that arguing we need to change the emphasis in Black History Month from all the things black people have accomplished, Mm -hmm. the great writers, the great inventors, to all the ways in which black people have been mistreated. Really? And I I did not see that. Yeah, it was a few days ago. That's wild to me. That's crazy, actually. But yeah, continue. (laughs) I I think this reflects... I think I, you know, I could have predicted that that Did op-ed person, would be released eventually. The person who wrote it was black? That's a good question. I don't, I don't remember. Okay. I think she was. Okay. Um, I'm actually not sure about that, though. She might have been Hispanic. In okay. any case. Uh, Do you know the, what the crux of the argument was? Just so I can see if I can steal man it. Crux, <laughs> okay, the crux of the argument was, yes, it's great that we celebrate George Washington Carver, or, uh, you know, we, we celebrate yeah. Langston Hughes and black people have done amazing things. But fundamentally, we have not addressed how deeply black people have been oppressed historically in this country. And so to focus on the ways in which black people have achieved despite, despite that oppression, mm-hmm. rather than focusing on the, imp- the, the oppression itself, mm-hmm. is a missed opportunity. For what? For coming to terms with how brutal America has been to black bodies. So it's interesting. I just went to, it's funny we're having this conversation. I just went to the Smithsonian African American Museum Mm. uh, in D.C. Uh, I was just there two days ago, actually. Mm. So saw it for the first time. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. An amazing, amazing museum. Um, 
And so I'm I'm thinking about my experience there as I ponder this uh, op-ed. I, I I don't I I guess I still don't know to what end. I I get I get the no I really don't get to what end uh, that would be for. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I'll read I'll read the op-ed if you could send it to me. Yeah. You know. Well, my take on it is that there is this there is this idea that is increasingly popular just in the past five years and especially in the past year Mm -hmm. with, and you know, reparations, the 1619 project are all of a piece with this sentiment, which is that if we can only really come to terms with the past, starting at 1619 to the present slavery, the black codes, Jim Crow, lynching, et cetera, redlining. If we could only educate people about this stuff more yeah and there's some point that we'll reach that will constitute a deep some kind of deep spiritual victory for the country and we what we have to do is keep reaching backwards in order to go forward yeah i don't think that that's how i think if if the argument is about material conditions and that's an argument that can be made and i could argue for and against that but if the argument is spiritual then I don't see how spiritual culmination um, comes to fruition through that process. Mm. By definition, that's not how spiritual work Mm -hmm. works Mm -hmm. by constantly trying to seek a sort of like cosmic justice Mm -hmm. in which everyone's forced to, it seems like perpetually reckon with the distant past, as opposed to equipping folks, both black and white and every color in between, in the present with the, uh, I guess, internal disposition to understand their internal worthiness, Mm -hmm. which is a totally different, like that is not achieved through constantly looking uh for a reckoning with the past and in fact those are two different projects actually yeah Yeah. and it's funny because no one's talking about that project Mm. and and i don't know people are sort of conflating things i think so yeah i i really couldn't agree more i think um the the injustices of history are a bottomless pit yeah and that doesn't mean you should not learn about them of course history is you know, it's, it's as important as, as every other subject in school. And mm-hmm. certainly I'm very open to arguments about this textbook in Texas. They call slaves immigrants here. Why do they do that? Oh, that's, that's inaccurate, crazy. misleading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's change that. All for it. Yeah. It's a very separate thing, I think, to, to argue that there's some point we're coming to. Yeah. That we just have to keep reaching and reaching and reaching for a reckoning with with our historical injustices and i think in practice if you look at there's a treadmill effect is 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 what i'm trying to say where Mm -hmm. every time we do get something that is a important acknowledgement Mm -hmm. of historical oppression such as the the museum Mm -hmm. in in dc which gets a few million views uh uh, visitors every year and has like if I'm which is correct, a national has, national project yeah, yeah. in the in the country's capital yeah and has extensive exhibits on slavery right yeah um and costs like hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. to, to build uh building that I don't think made a dent in mm-hmm. this spiritual hole that some people feel sure. about the past sure nor did 50 years of affirmative action, which was initially sometimes called compensatory justice because mm-hmm. it was argued for as a kind of reparations back in the 60s right. before the rationale changed, nor has, you know, national apologies for slavery um, that, you know, the, that Congress did, you know, some 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. I don't see any of these things as having really healed the hole that people seem mm-hmm. to feel acknowledging that that hole is real yeah however if it's a spiritual thing you can't fill it by political means yeah that's the irony is that we're having a political conversation to address a spiritual issue uh and i don't know that that point has been raised um like as a protest against a lot of the a lot of the ways in which we're talking about this as a nation Mm. um so yeah that that isn't that is an irony 
ultimately. So I, I don't know what will happen as a result because this seems like a very new wave uh, of like this this new type of conversation that we're having about race mm -hmm. was not the conversation we were having. I mean, I don't remember us having this conversation when Obama was in office. Me neither. This was this was not the t the tone and tenor mm -hmm. that characterizes this current conversation was not the tone and tenor when Obama was in office. Not at all. So it's striking to me um, that we're having it now, and I'm I'm sort of perplexed by why why now. So here is one theory, and I don't know if it's right. Okay. Um. Whether or not they they could say so. Most people have a very politics heavy theory mm -hmm. of how groups advance materially. Okay. Sure. I think most people, you know, just assume that you get the right politicians in, mm -hmm. people become wealthier. Right. Sure. That politics comes before economics and is the causal factor. Okay. So if you think about why it was that, you know, in 1964 or 65, the civil rights movements won its greatest political victories, mm -hmm. the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. Why is it at that moment that the riots start mm. in uh, northern cities, in Newark and Detroit and whatnot? Okay. Why, why at the point of greatest victory? Why at the point of greatest victory in terms of getting a black president, sure. do race relations seem to go? Deteriorate. In, in, yeah, deteriorate. Yeah. What it might be is a mismatch between expectations and reality. Because people okay. have that implicit theory of politics, you know, sort of, it's like a trickle-down theory. Like, you get the right politicians and yeah. sort of, like, the material circumstances get better. Right. What happened is we got a black president, and then four years later, we, you know, we heard the video of uh, Trayvon yeah. getting stalked by George, George Zimmerman. We saw, you know, Michael Brown got killed and yeah. Alton Sterling. And so there was like there was a the expectation yeah. that r rose along with social media showing us yeah. that some of the realities and the distance between those two things created this outrage. That's interesting. So do you think that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for social media? My guess is that the, yes, yeah, that okay. probably wouldn't have happened, but or or not to the same extent. Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. I think that my theory, which I am coming up with right now, uh, is that as material conditions increase, um, and it, it doesn't have to necessarily be this case, but this this is actually part of my criticism of like excessive capitalism mm. as material. As material conditions become better, a lack of purpose or lack of the feeling of purpose becomes more um, sensitively felt by a civilization. Mm -hmm. And this results in um, a mismatch in the sense that um, people are actually looking, people, people are wealthier on the whole, but mm -hmm. are actually suffering from spiritual impoverishment. Mm -hmm. And then they come up with, they come up with ideas to rectify that, which is what we talked about earlier, but those ideas are material in nature and not spiritual, and therefore um, not able to actually meet the the challenge. Mm. Um, and I think, I think that there's a total difference between the caliber of folks like, you know, Maya Angelou and Langston Hughes, and the, the way they spoke about the human condition. Mm. Um, given everything that they lived through mm. was very different than some of the figures I think of who are writing in the New York times and who are, who are saying certain things about the nature of man today vis-a-vis -vis race. Mm. Um, and so I think it's interesting that even though, you know, the, the poets and writers of the Harlem Renaissance era were dealing with far worse uh, material conditions mm they were in a way spiritually more advanced mm. than the current generation of writers. There's one theory of that which says the reason, the reason that the writers and thinkers and leaders of that era were better were because there was less incentive to be such a person to begin with. To be, you, uh, to be what kind of person? So if I think of like, what it took to to be on the front lines of the civil right, 
civil rights movement. Sure. A willingness to put your body on the line, um, to take what was an unpopular position until mm -hmm. until the sixties and even still kind of unpopular mm -hmm. in the early sixties. Um, so willingness to take an unpopular position, no guarantee of financial success, mm -hmm. um, bodily harm. Mm -hmm. And the people who rise to the top in such a system are people that are highly principled. Right, and, sure. Uh, today, if you look at, you know, the incentives to become, uh, you know, a, a New York Times writer about race who's, you know, who's writing things like should black children and white children even be friends right and, you know all of these <laughs> which was just wild all honestly of these crazy things that passed if that was written time. yeah that that was absurd yeah but like yeah. you can write that you know the mainstream will accept you because yeah at least like the mainstream journalistic institutions sure accept that it attracts a kind of person that is on average less excellent yeah but I don't know. I I don't understand why there's less excellence mm. in the in. I mean, I don't know that there is. Uh, mm. We're talking about a very elite group of people. Mm. Um, but given that we're talking about a very elite group of people, I don't understand why there's less less excellence in that among that population in that community. Mm -hmm. I don't. I get that there are incentives to write in certain ways to be sort of like uh, useful to. Uh, these journalistic institutions that are using clickbait for, you know, for to get as many eyes as possible. Um, but that still doesn't really, I don't think, explain the tr the downward trend in terms of spiritual uh, impoverishment. So you think the rising material circumstances it helps explain that? I think at ba at at the very least, there's a correlation that hasn't been. That hasn't been explained. That hasn't been explored in depth. Mm. Um, and it's ironic because it would change the nature of our conversations about concepts like privilege and stuff. Because mm. if you're, uh, ironically, pe a lot of people who talk about concepts like white privilege and uh, economic inequality among along racial lines um, are oftentimes super critical as I am, of excesses of capitalism, of capitalist excess. But the terms with which they discuss this are actually still very much material, mm. which is super ironic, right? Because they're making a, a critique of materialism, but they don't realize that they're still using materialist terms to, mm. to criticize it. Whereas if the issue is primarily, or at least in part, um, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's exclusively, but certainly primarily a spiritual issue, then, then the solution is not merely to talk about um, material inequality. Hmm. And in fact, one, would, one could argue that, or one could ask the question, what are the implications of the fact that, you know, folks like the Harlem Renaissance writers were materially poorer than their white, often racist counterparts, hmm and yet were more spiritually mature and thus arguably lived a more fulfilling life. Mm. And so that changes the nature of what you measure mm. when it comes to um, access to um, a, a quality life. Mm. Because you're not looking in a material lens, you're looking through a, through a spiritual lens. That's very interesting to me. And one, I think I've actually had very similar thoughts to that myself. Like okay. I, I've looked at someone who, for example, is uh, very exercised about the wealth gap mm -hmm. between blacks and whites. Yeah. If I were to catch them in a completely non-political mode mm -hmm. and talk to them about what is the value of wealth, mm -hmm. and in their mind they weren't thinking about the wealth gap or anything like that, how important is money to living a good life? Mm -hmm. They would probably say something like, well, once you have the basics, yeah, most of what 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 it means to be happy is as like a social creature to like have great friendships, great relationships, yeah, to cultivate beautiful relationships with other people, to see the world, um, to live by a set of values. Mm -hmm. However, if you talk about gaps in wealth, there's this implicit assumption, I think that 
that material circumstances are everything. Yeah. It's not that they would say so, but the idea is like if you equalize wealth, you're equalizing happiness. Right. Which is interesting because if you if you're if you're if you poll black people versus white people on like happiness measures or like spending time with family measures, mm-hmm. you'll find you'll you'll find some kind of disparities that aren't really predicted by the economics at all. Right. Yeah. So I feel like I remember Jonathan Haidt talking about something similar in his first book, The Happiness Hypothesis, where mm. he pointed out that like at a certain median income or past a certain median income, there is no correlation between money and happiness. Mm. And in fact, that if you were to compare, and I'm generalizing, I don't remember the exact statistics, but if you were to compare the happiness level of a single male individual who has like millions of dollars to a young a, a, a poor 40 year old um african-american woman with diabetes mm-hmm. the likelihood that but but like she is married and she mm-hmm. has a church community mm-hmm. and um she has a she has a network as it were mm-hmm. she is far more likely to be happier than that a uh, single young white male bachelor who has all the money. Mm. And so like, what are the implications of that for when we talk about privilege mm. is a question that I've always wanted to explore and have wanted people to like think more deeply about. Yeah. This, that reminds me of Yuval Noah Harari's book Sapiens mm-hmm. um, in which he argues persuasively. I think that humans were happier in hunter gatherer societies mm. than as farming peasants. Mm. that's a separate question from whether we're happier now sure um but i think the agricultural revolution made the typical person less happy that's a pretty persuasive case to make um because you know obviously there was less wealth in the world yeah uh you were living day by day hunting um but you had more space uh less crowding no urbanization Mm -hmm. often your work day was not nearly as long as it it was if you were say a rice farmer in right. china right um and that in a very big picture sense is making a similar point about the surprising lack of correlation between wealth and happiness in certain instances that can be certainly overstated mm-hmm. um, sure definitely yeah but i think that is an important argument to inject so let's pivot a little bit okay you talk about Israel yeah. quite often. Yeah. How did you come to care about that issue? So I was raised in a very atypical Christian background, very uh, similar uh, to Seventh-day Adventists. So I went to church on Saturdays instead of Sundays. I grew up observing uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur instead of Christmas and Easter. Uh, so I grew up with a lot of Jewish culture, even though I'm not Jewish. And that inevitably, I think, led to a lot of cultural affinity for j- the Jewish community. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in 2012, when I was in college, I noticed that globally anti-Semitism was rising mm-hmm. in places like France and in Europe at large. And on a deeply psychological level, uh, because because we shared so many cultural things, uh, I felt anti-Semitism, not, I, I felt something against anti-Semitism, not only because um, it was against Jewish people, but I also felt it, felt as though it were a personal attack on me as well because of how I was raised with all of these different cultural um, uh, things to which I belong, traditions to which I belong. Mm. So that led me to do a lot of research into anti-Semitism and Israel advocacy and stuff like that. And eventually I, started a student pro-Israel club at the University of New Orleans where I did Israel advocacy for three and a half years, um, moved to New York afterwards, but then, and worked at the Wall Street Journal, but uh, after I was at the Wall Street Journal for a year, also continued to work in the Israel space for two years before starting my own uh, company. So, but that's like the, that's the story of how I got involved. Mm. So I have a question. Yeah. Why does Black Lives Matter have a position on Israel Palestine. One, another way of phrasing yeah, it is it's a great question. If you were to ask Palestinians if they have an opinion on Black Lives Matter, yeah. I doubt that whether they would even have heard of it. Uh much less of whether their politics on the issue of race in America would be straightforwardly predictable. 
Well, Palestinian Americans probably have. Right, um, but I mean Palestinians. But Palestinians, right. like in the West Bank. Yeah. Um, well, the reason why Black Lives Matter, um, and I'll speak, I'll say this about like national Black Lives Matter. This mm-hmm. isn't necessarily true for local Black Lives Matter chapters mm-hmm. who really don't, in my experience, it varies from place to place whether or not they have an opinion on this at all. They're usually dealing with local issues. But National Black Lives Matter has an opinion because it sees itself within the same um, tradition of the... It, it's a it's a certain tradition that has... That, that is a part of black America, but it's not the Kingian tradition. Mm-hmm. It's a much more uh, explicitly anti-West, anti-Western tradition in the sense that it sees the West uh, explicitly and exclusively as "quote unquote" the oppressive white man, mm. and then it and then it associates in an ignorant fashion, um, or it takes everything that it associates with "quote unquote" the white man um, as being oppressive by the transitive property, mm. um, and have knowing absolutely nothing about uh, Israel or. Or, and in addition to not knowing anything about Israel, taking their understanding of American history with regard to slavery and Jim Crow mm-hmm. and uh, projecting it onto other countries' histories, they then come to the conclusion that Israel is an oppressor. That is exactly what I think. Yeah, Which that's is why. interesting because, so I watched a debate, I've watched the debate more than once actually, between Alan Dershowitz and Peter Beinart. Okay, yeah. Um, Classic. Great, great debate. <laughs> Yeah. Um, both very smart on the issue of Israel Palestine. And Alan Dershowitz argued that the only or the main reason why there is an outside f- outsize focused on Israel from the global community mm-hmm. is anti Semitism. Mm-hmm. And I think that is only true of some aspects of the focus on Israel. Sure. If you were to argue why why does the Muslim world focus so much on Israel? anti-Semitism has to be a part of that explanation. However, if you go to a college campus in America and you see a bunch of uh, probably mostly white, but, you know, a diverse group of, uh, you know, economically privileged kids on an Ivy League university Mm -hmm. waving flags for for, uh, boycott, divest, sanction, Mm -hmm. I don't think they're anti-Semites, and I don't think they're inspired by anti-Semitism. I think they're, as you said, they're grafting U.S. politics onto Israel-Palestine. Yeah. And it's become a symbolic issue, and that's why it's aligned with Black Lives Matter, Mm -hmm. um, because people see it as symbolically the same thing, which is interesting because back in the 60s and early 70s, Mm -hmm. Bayard Rustin, who is a, a favorite writer of mine mm-hmm. and a key figure in the civil rights movement, he used to argue that we should support Israel precisely because it's similar to uh, right. our situation. However, with the opposite, where, where Israel is analogous to black Americans right. and it, Israel's uh, enemies are analogous to white supremacists. Even prior to the 60s and 70s, I mean, I have a book on my bookshelf called The New Negro, which I think was written... Mm-hmm in the 20s and it's a collection of essays uh written by people active in the harlem renaissance movement and in the foreword they make mention of zionism as like the the model for for a black american renaissance so yeah i think it it depends on like not just where your politics lies but the fundamental spirit of uh of how you see the world i think ultimately if you see the world through a what I would call redemptive lens, mm-hmm. then um, you don't come to this sort of like Manichean black versus white understanding mm-hmm. of of society and the way the world works. And if you don't have that lens, then your views on Israel are probably going to be closer to mine. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you do have that view, if you do take that view, if you do think that life is ultimately one big fight between blacks and whites, mm-hmm. um, the West and the rest, mm-hmm. then you are more likely to, to find yourself expressing anti-Zionist uh, ideas. And what's ironic though, when it comes to, Black America specifically. What's ironic in taking 
the latter position is that in order to do so, you would have to deny the rich legacy that black Americans have contributed to America. Because if, you, if, if your view of America is exclusively one of, uh, you know, the white oppressor, then you, by definition, are ignoring the black contribution to it. You're choosing to downplay it or dismiss it or say that it's irrelevant, ultimately. And I think that that's the, the most profound irony of that sort of viewpoint. That's interesting. I've noticed that as well. You know, I, I've read in, you know, Thomas Sowell, who, you know, famous black conservative slash libertarian. Mm -hmm. He is very fond of pointing out the amazing success of certain black institutions. You know, in the 1800s, there were black politicians, you know, in Detroit. Mm -hmm. I think he, he, you know, that, that's like a fact that only Thomas Sowell would point out. Or, yeah. you know, there were black schools before integration that in some cases outscored white schools mm -hmm. in the same city like Dunbar mm -hmm. high school in Washington and whatnot. Um, okay. Slight shift of topic. <laughs> okay. Again. It's like speed round. <laughs> yeah. You are unusually good at Twitter. Thank you. <laughs> What's your secret? Ah, uh, I don't know if I have a secret. Um, I think Twitter is definitely giving me the most bang for my buck. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I, I think that it is very possible to seriously exchange ideas on Twitter. Mm -hmm. If you know, if you are deliberate about, you know, curating your Twitter account in such a way and, um, trying to engage people seriously w with serious ideas and avoiding the trolls or blocking the trolls or not even indulging the trolls. I think that there is a way, um, to really, again, just like curate and facilitate important conversations with people mm -hmm. um but also i would say another reason why i've been successful on twitter is because my if you were to ask me what my politics or my political orientation is it would probably i would probably respond by by not answering the question um but if i had to give you an answer it would probably be art mm. Uh, and so that, which is to say that I talk about a whole host of issues on Twitter that have nothing to do with politics, mm -hmm. but that have political implications, mm -hmm. um, or have implications for how I view politics mm -hmm. or how I develop a uh, political language when talking about political issues. But ultimately it stems back to my, um, love of and fascination with the human condition, which I find is both tragic and triumphant at the same time. That's just my general view of the, of the way the world works mm. and the way human beings operate. And then that informs the way I look at a lot of things, including like when I get into arguments with people on Twitter and that results in a very, uh, in a much less harsh tone with people mm. that I disagree with. And I think that people notice that. Um, and they, and people notice that I'm, I'm willing to have conversations with them, yeah. uh, even if I disagree with that, with them. And it's not just that I'm willing to have conversations with them in the sense of this sort of really, um, uh, I love the IDW, but like the IDW has this tendency to be super like, I don't know, like still politically adjacent and nerdy about, mm -hmm. about the way they have conversations mm -hmm. with people they disagree with. Mm -hmm. Um, but my approach is like. I disagree with you, but I still think you are, I, I still believe fundamentally in your eternal worthiness, mm -hmm. which is a spiritual, uh, it's a spiritual claim. It's not just the, it's not just a, a politically heterodox claim. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something deeper to that ultimately. And so I would say that probably contributes to, to some of my popularity on Twitter. I love the idea that your political orientation is art. Yeah. It's just like an intentional category error, but yeah. <laughs> in a space that needs category errors yeah. because most of Twitter is so boring and predictable mm -hmm. and your, your Twitter is, it is not boring and yeah. not, not predictable. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, not, uh, topic isn't predictable. Yeah. The viewpoint isn't predictable. Sometimes you know, I might um, be talking about, you know, Jordan Peterson one day, the next day I might be talking about Jay-Z. Exactly. And it's this, but it's, it's the same lens and which is art that produces that. Uh, what do you think about the role of hip hop in American culture? Well, I personally think that hip hop is like, I, I think hip hop is uh, the the greatest thing since the ancient bards. <laughs> like, I think I think hip hop, what it does with language, mm. um, is is equivalent to what Homer did with things like the Odyssey. Mm. And I I, uh, I don't I don't know that people have made that connection, but that's mm. that seems to me to be very obvious. I think it's one of the greatest literary. Uh, 
it's part of the literary heritage of the West mm -hmm. and of America. Um, and one of its greatest uh, contributions that African Americans have made to the West. Mm -hmm. So, well, both the Homer and but both Homer and 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 hip hop use rhyming as a means to facilitate memorization. And, yeah. Um, like infectiousness of yeah, uh, of of like uh, language. Yeah, and 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 what what both of those like do with storytelling is insane on a on a genius level. I mean, obviously, I'm talking about like good hip hop, not mm -hmm. like trash hip hop, but like in general, the genre is is a brilliant mechanism for storytelling, and that shouldn't be taken for granted because storytelling is a very humanizing, mm -hmm. um, uh, humanizing. Uh, tool. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ironic to me when people who love hip hop or who claim to love hip hop come to certain conclusions about white people, because it it doesn't like when they come to like or any people who they generalize about mm. that doesn't make any sense to me. It's sort of like missing the lesson in, embedded in hip hop mm. to a certain extent. What's that lesson? Uh, the complexity of the human condition mm. and the and the uniqueness of of every human being and. And how important it is to tell it, how important it is that human beings tell their story. Mm. You know, that sort of like is missed when people on the one hand say they love, you know, Jay Z, and then on the other hand, in another tweet, are like making a politically derisive comment about like white people in general. Mm. Like that to me that seems to, to be a mismatch. Mm. So I tend to agree. Um, I think. If you actually look at most rappers, mm -hmm. they tend to be people, at least the the ones that stand the test of time, very high verbal intelligence, yeah, very high open mindedness, mm -hmm. um, very high emotional introspection, yeah, um, incredibly high emotional introspection, yeah. Even even if they're rapping completely about violence yeah. or gang. Like it, the 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 type of person who comes from the hood comes from a place where violence is normalized, yeah, and ends up becoming a rapper instead of someone who is, yeah, a gangbanger, yeah, yeah. They were the artsy kid, yeah. They were the artsy kid who, to whatever extent they were involved in criminal activity, mm -hmm. still primarily viewed themselves as, are as most artists do as having some crisis of meaning that yeah. needed that that facilitate that require that they invent their own meaning structure. Yeah, I mean, I think about that a lot when I think about Kendrick Lamar, and I have, this is sort of my problem with folks like Tommy Lahren, who's, whose commentary on hip hop is bereft of awareness of that, mm. of uh, like the, the taking at face value, the story where a rapper's talking about um, the time when they, when they were involved in, in a gang is as silly as, it's as silly as like taking Romeo and Juliet and thinking that Shakespeare is like, like, uh, you know, glorifying <laughs> like these f family feuds when obviously that's not the point. Like watching the Godfather and being like, well, this is violent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is, it's, there's it's, nothing it's, redeeming here. At yeah. All. There's nothing, there's no lesson in this to, to learn from. It's really, uh, quite small minded. Um, and just uninteresting <laughs> as a, as a point of analysis. Yeah. So. I do think there is a dynamic. So, like, if you're going to analyze the lyrics of a hip hop song without an understanding of the potential for irony, yeah, like Kendrick Lamar, yeah, yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. understand anything if you don't understand his use of irony. Yeah. Um. However, I do worry about uh, the death of hip hop being marked by its importation into the the mainstream institutions of academic study okay what do you mean by that so i feel like jazz used to be huge yeah jazz was popular you know in the late 50s it was american popular music mm -hmm. now it's not at all popular but you can major in it okay <laughs> so i'm i wonder if that yeah. happened to hip-hop i don't know that jazz was ever as i mean i know it was global but I don't know if it was as global as hip hop is today. Mm. And because hip hop is so global, I don't know that it would ever be like, it would become a relic. That being said, I mean, Homer used to be big and now he's <laughs> studied in philosophy 
majors. So maybe that's just the way that things go. And maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of timing. Hopefully if it does happen, it won't happen in our lifetimes or for another thousand lifetimes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's sort of the compromise that we would have to look for. Yeah. So one thing people, not a lot of people know about you is that you make music. Yes, I do. Yeah. On SoundCloud under the name Paradox. Yes. Why Paradox? Uh, that's a good question. I used to, I remember, I'm trying to remember the answer to this question uh, because there was a, I started making music about a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. So I was always drawn to music when I would uh, take edibles and I would, I would slowly but surely experiment with drumming on djembes. And uh, a couple years ago, I started to teach myself guitar as well. And I always w- was, was, was also like very much moved by gospel and what mm-hmm. gospel did with different um, chord progressions and, uh, and and I was also oh this is why paradox okay I'm I'm glad you asked me that because now I know now I remember I was always drawn to artists who lived in paradox mm. so artists like Prince for example the way he plays with the space between romantic love and divine love mm. um is one of the most incredible paradoxes that I've seen displayed in an artist because like the way he would you know in in the song "I Would Die for You," present both a both a romantic message, but also a divine message in the way that he was describing his love for a person was, I think, really beautiful. Mm. Um, the same way like Stevie Wonder does that in the song "As" when he's describing his love that he has for a human being, but it's very clear that the love is like divinely inspired. Mm. And I always love the the blurring of the lines between between those things. I'm also, in general, a spiritual person. And spirituality, I think, plays in the space of paradox. Mm. Uh, when I think of biblical figures like King David, for example, who was a very paradoxical figure, who was someone who, um, who you know, as the story goes, as a young man, slayed Goliath and found favor with God, but also uh, committed incredible sins, and in 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 uh, committing adultery and murdering someone in order to get the woman that he wanted, and neglecting his sons as a father, and yet all he had all these qualities and and vices, but he was also still ultimately known as quote unquote a man after God's own heart, mm-hmm. and that complexity, um, I think, is quite beautiful. And and if we as a society or as a culture were to study that complexity and internalize. Uh, the ability to hold space for two seemingly disparate ideas, qualities at once, I think would be a, a much healthier society. Um, and so paradox does that. Also, DJing is fundamentally about playing with paradox because like, if you're a good DJ, you can take something that's really slow BPM and somehow make it match with something that's really fast BPM. And the, and the, the, the combination of the two uh, when the audience hears it, that's where the, they go crazy. Mm. Uh, so that's why I chose that name. When you speak about David, it reminded me about uh, reminded me of Cardi B. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like I could see that amazing creative yeah. mind. Yeah. Also used to drug like drug men and steal their money yeah. in another life. Paradox. Paradox. Yeah. It also sounded like uh, David would be canceled today, or that oh, cancel no, culture yeah. doesn't allow for paradox. Well, see, I so that's why I I ultimately think cancel culture can't last. If we are, if we are a, a society that believes in art, I don't think cancel culture can last because art has to play in the space of paradox and has to good art has to play in the space of complexity. And as long as we yearn for good art, I think. That, that that will that will always have an advantage over a cancel culture. This is culture. what Kanye said. You want crazy art, but you don't want it from crazy people. Oh, is that what he said? Yeah. yeah. He said you want crazy art from sane people. And that yeah. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't work. But what if as a culture we just become accustomed to sane art? Boring I don't know art. what that I don't know what that looks like. Boring art. Art that never thinks outside the box. I don't know what that looks I don't think that's art. I don't I don't know what that looks like. Like I can't conceptualize what that means. Hmm. And I don't think there are artistic trends that indicate we're there are political trends, but I don't think there are cultural trends that indicate we're going we're heading in that direction. I think we have a lot of crazy artists right now, and that is ultimately a good thing for society, you know. Who are underrated artists that you think 
people should Ooh. know about. So my one of my favorite bands of the past. Besides Paradox, of course. Right, of course, yes, yes. Check them out. Check out my SoundCloud. No, um, <laughs> my my favorite artist, one of my favorite artists of the past uh, four years now, is a band called Ifa, spelled I F E, uh, based out of Puerto Rico. They debuted their their album in 2017. NPR called them. The article said that the only regret that I have in listening to this album is that I cannot listen to it for the first time ever again. Wow. Yeah. And it blends like a lot of uh cultural traditions from from the uh ancient religion of Yoruba. Mm. Um so the the main band leader Oturo Moon uh is from Indiana originally but moved to Puerto Rico and converted to the Yoruba religion and really it's a the album is a beautiful celebration of that religion and his experience but it it's such a beautiful album mm. um and i think they're up and coming but i've seen them twice in brooklyn and they're just incredible i also stalked him and eventually had him on my podcast so <laughs> check out the interview if people are interested but yeah ifa is is definitely a band to watch um that's the that's the only one that comes immediately to mind i'm a huge fan of ben howard uh, who's a famous singer, songwriter, guitarist out of the UK. He's the reason why I started learning guitar, started teaching myself guitar. Um, I've been obsessed with him since high school. Uh, some, a lot of people know about him, but I think more people could could stand to know about him because he's brilliant, especially not only in playing the guitar, which I think he's a genius mm. at, at acoustic guitar specifically, um, but his lyrics are just profound and and really ultimately about the human condition. I mean, I could talk about other artists that I love, but they aren't. Um, a lot of them are already mainstream. So, <laughs> one of your songs on SoundCloud has uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Yes, as the picture. Why him? So, I don't know if you noticed the lyrics in that song. What I was doing was I was combining lyrics from I was combining a uh, verse from a, a poem by Edgar Allan Poe uh where he goes she loved with a love that was more than love so I took that lyric and then I combined it with a lyric from Nina Simone's song Come Ye and I thought it was just interesting because both of these artists were describing or, or trying to describe love mm. in these two different pieces and and so I I, I named that song Poe after after the verse See, that's what I love about you. Yeah. Very few people would think to combine Edgar Allan Poe and Nina Simone. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, and I think like that's all, that also speaks to my obsession with paradox. Or, and, which is not necessarily paradox, but it's like combining people that you wouldn't have necessarily put together, mm. you know? Um, what does James Baldwin mean to you? Ooh. I mean, James Baldwin was like, he, he was such a, he was such a spiritual figure and, and deeply, insightful i think about the human condition you know i teach baldwin in in some of the work that i do i teach uh, the fire next time mm. uh and also everybody's protest novel which i think is incredibly relevant for today um but his ability to just to, to peel back the political layers and peel back the political rhetoric and and get to the heart of of the humanness of uh of certain very challenging things that were going on in his day was brilliant and a, a, quite a rare talent um that i hope to be able to 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 do in like manner so i also it's weird because i think a lot of people quote james baldwin but they don't read him <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and and so that's just interesting to me how 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 that happens and you know some people can sort of like not even take him out of context just like are just very not well read when it comes to baldwin um and so one of the things i hope to change culturally is is that trend i think baldwin and alexis de tocqueville are similar mm -hmm. in that they wrote so much and they were so their their minds were so pliable yeah and not boring yeah interesting that you can quote them in support of a lot of very different sure and sometimes opposing sure um beliefs so i feel like in that sense james baldwin I, f I view James Baldwin in the same sense that I view, like, a hip-hop artist, mm. right? Because, like, and Jay-Z talks about this in his autobiography, Decode It, where he says, I always confuse people because on one hand, in one rap I'm saying F the police, and in another rap 
in another situation, I'm ho- I'm actually holding a, a benefit for police officers. Mm-hmm. And people don't understand like the complexity of that, of what I'm doing with that. Mm-hmm. And I think that, I mean, I obviously haven't spoken to James Baldwin, but I think that something <laughs> similar was going on, um, was going on with that. And again, this goes back to giving people or allowing people to just like have space to change their minds and change it back again and, mm-hmm. and be angry sometimes and say things that aren't so healthy that reflect that anger, but then after further reflection, change their minds. Um, and I wish that we would sort of, uh, approach our understanding of these historical figures in that way. And also like, I think I should probably approach certain contemporary figures whose ideas I don't like in that way as well and sort of hold space for them emotionally, Mm -hmm. even while disagreeing with them politically. Mm -hmm. Complete pivot again. (laughs) Um, we, you and I once met at a charter school. We ran, Did into, we? we ran into each other at a charter school. I don't know if you remember. Oh, in the Bronx. Oh, in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wow, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it was. Um, <laughs> New Orleans, mm-hmm. famously, after Katrina, yeah. built many charter schools. Yeah. Um, the question is, what do you think of charter schools in general? Are they a good thing? Should we expand them? Are they bad? Should we attack them as some politicians are doing now? Um, so I was a product of a charter school education. Mm-hmm. I graduated from, shout out to Benjamin Franklin High School, the best school in all of Louisiana, um, which is a charter school. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had a great experience, but mm-hmm. at the same time, I will say one of the books I just read for work was a textbook called The History of Education in America, mm-hmm. uh, fourth edition. And what I learned from there is like, there is no guarantee that a charter school is going to necessarily be better than a public school it just depends on how the charter school is run it depends on the amount of resources in the district that are allocated to that school it depends on a whole host of factors that make it impossible to say whether or not charter schools writ large are better than public schools writ large some of them are some of them aren't politicians may be playing a different game Mm -hmm. um that is uh you know politically expedient for them but that's a separate question Mm -hmm. uh just based upon my personal experience and also based upon the research i've done from whether or not you know public schools first are better or worse than charter schools from what i know charter schools have tended to work in cities okay have tended to not work in not cities Yeah, yeah yeah i could see that i could see that geographical i don't know why that is i i don't know why either um it has something to do with the allocation of resources, probably, though, mm-hmm. that are available in cities that are less available or not available in more rural areas. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I don't personally have a problem with them, but I could see how and why, again, not talking about politicians, because that there's a whole host of other factors that are at play with politicians, mm-hmm. for good and for, for worse. Mm-hmm. Um, but I could see how and why parents would and would not want charter schools, given set of circumstances they may be dealing with so i can see to me i can't really see why they wouldn't want the option okay well i think that they may not want the option if they have proof that like if you if you have the choice of if it's a zero-sum game if you have the choice of really reforming a public school Mm -hmm. like if you if you think that you can make the case if you take a given public school that's not doing so well, but it clearly was doing well before, so something happened, mm-hmm. that's fixable. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's the case of like having that process happen or taking all the funds out of that school mm-hmm. and then investing it in a charter school. Mm-hmm. I could imagine why a parent would not necessarily like that, especially if they themselves went to this high school Right. And they have some sort of like emotional attachment to it and they feel a legacy and they want to restore it to its former, you know, mm-hmm. glory. Mm-hmm. I could see a whole host of reasons for that. So in general, yeah, I, I can see that in that case. Yeah. In the general case, or if you have a charter school that's coming into a neighborhood where the public schools have been failing for for a long time, decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the line to get into the public school is thousands of kids long. Yeah. In those cases, just not the enough opposition really, yeah. really does baffle me okay that's fair yeah it could be it, it's weird because there's not enough there's not enough uh real estate so why not build more real estate mm-hmm. essentially mm-hmm. by building a charter school yeah i hear that 
I hear that. The, the truth is I'm not really at all exercised by it because when, when, when you're talking about politicians being crazy, that doesn't, I mean, I know it affects people and I know it's really I'm talking bad. about non-politicians. Oh, non-politicians. Yes. Yeah, okay. Like, so like parents, for example. Or journalists. Or, or journalists. You know, okay. Twitter people. Sure. Twitter uh, people. Well, Twitter people are a whole, and you know, That's we are, we are I guess a part of that, weird. but. I don't know. I don't know. That's less my, I'm not, I'm not that passionate about it. Maybe I should be, but as a result, I'm not really an expertise on it, an expert on it. So, so the theory of enchantment, yeah. what is it? So theory of enchantment is my startup, uh, that I created a year ago. And what it is, is a framework and a curriculum that I designed that teaches social emotional learning through the lens of pop culture. Mm. Um, so really taking a lot of the things that we've been talking about with regard to art, and this mm. goes back to, I think, why my politics is ultimately art. Mm. Um, taking famous books, famous music, famous movies, and mining that data mm. to distill lessons about the human condition mm. in order to teach people how to be in better relationship with themselves and with their community around them. I like that idea mainly because I think a lot of the reason that kids don't get interested in ideas is because we give them the ancient stuff before we give them the stuff that they understand intuitively. Okay. And this is partly based on personal experience. Sure. I did not become very interested in ideas until I read great science and philosophy books from the past 20, 30 years. Okay, so very recent. I didn't get interested in it by reading Plato. Okay. Reading more recent stuff made me interested increasingly in the whole legacy of the Western sure. canon. Okay, that's interesting. But I think people more naturally understand more intuitively, more easily, mm -hmm. the things have, that have been created in their own time. Mm -hmm. And so to draw a link between pop culture and all of the, you know, to, to and Shakespeare. Yeah. As I think you do. Yeah. That is an idea that really intrigues me. So do you think that that's typical of most people's experience in in school, for example? Like like that they would be able to relate more to Plato if they were first given in a curriculum setting um, more contemporary? Maybe. Maybe, yeah. I mean, what I know is that most people who read Shakespeare didn't resonate with it. Or okay. tended to to get the good grade. Sure. But aren't reading it on their own time. Fair. I was a nerd. I mean, I still am. I was a nerd when it came to English literature. Mm -hmm. So especially like in high school. Uh, so, you know, the Franklin <coughs> taught Homer and Shakespeare and, you know, Scarlet Letter and all of these, all of these different uh, quote unquote ancient uh, texts that I don't know if it it was more, probably more the teacher. The teacher is is responsible for so much um in terms of in terms of making or breaking a student or rather or rather closing or opening the student's gaze or horizon um when it comes to life. And so I I I'd say probably a combination of of those things. Co combination of the teacher who's teaching the material mm -hmm. um and the ability to connect the past to the present. Mm -hmm. Uh but I would say that like it's ironic to me. This is a, this is interesting because we talked about hip hop earlier. It's ironic to me that some people who are sort of like this happens on the right and the left. There are folks on the right who esteem the value of Shakespeare, but then are confounded by the brilliance of hip hop, mm. and that is so ironic to me. And then there are folks on the left who love hip hop, or who claim to love the cultural legacy of hip hop, but then in the same breath will dismiss Shakespeare as an old white man, mm. proving that they understand not, none of what they are talking about, neither hip hop nor Shakespeare. Mm. Um, so I think that the more we can bridge the gap between the past and the present mm. through literary experiences mm. uh, in K through 12 and in college, I think the better and the more well-rounded we'll be as a society and, a, and as a country. In that vein, I think if you understand why the Montagues and the Capulets yeah. hated each other, yeah. you understand more about inner city gang violence yeah. 
than someone who attributes it all to material circumstances, poverty, yeah. for example. That's a good that's a good point. Yeah, I hadn't thought about the poverty piece or the material conditions piece. Um, but yeah, Shakespeare, uh, Romeo and Juliet is a gang story. I mean, just so people understand, yeah. <laughs> it's a story about gang begging and a romance that happens uh, like against the backdrop of that, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so I I challenge and encourage people who may have um, a a very much caricaturing uh, perspective of folks who live in the ghetto who are are inevitably experiencing things like gang activity and like um dealing with drugs and violence and things of that nature i encourage people to look at that and explore that and think about that through the lens of their understanding of the great books that they esteem because once you do i think you can begin to humanize that which you previously only saw through a very caricatured um and and distant distant lens Mm. Okay, so my last question is about branding. Okay. Ooh, I don't know. Okay. What about it? <laughs> I've heard you talk about branding in a way that is deeper than most people view the concept. Explicitly? I think so. Okay, remind me. <laughs> um, maybe I'm misidentifying this, but... And perhaps this has to do with theory of enchantment. Okay, probably. But you've talked about the importance of branding. I mean, the only... So let me let me throw a few thoughts and see if anything comes to your head as interesting to say. One is that I've always been a little bit mystified by the importance that is attached to brand. Okay. And so when my friend, you know, lines up at 6 a.m. to get the the new Supreme hoodie and pays yeah, yeah, yeah. $700 for it, yeah. I'm like, dude, I just got a pretty nice hoodie for twenty dollars. <laughs> it looks the same. I'm gonna yeah. use my other six hundred eighty to go like buy something useful. Sure. <laughs> and he's like, "No, you're missing the point. Like yeah. you, you lack like the sense organ that's detecting something out there in the world that is very real. Yeah. And that's the value of the brand. On the other hand, I've heard like straightforward econ, maybe not one on one, but like econ arguments for branding. Okay. The importance of the brand is like. You're in a store, you see 10 different kinds of toothpastes, mm-hmm. you, you don't, it's too costly to get information about each one and know which one is the best. Sure. So rather than do that, you just get Aquafina because you know it's not horrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the value of a brand. It's like reducing the amount of time you have to spend distinguishing between products. Sure. So do you have a philosophy of branding that is deeper than that? So the econ piece... I get it, but it, I find it uninteresting. Meaning, like, I would totally buy the no the Walgreens version of the toothpaste because I know that it's the but same. But that's thing. more branding. So, would you buy the? Would you? Would Meaning, you experiment with the form of toothpaste you've never heard of? Well, I'm comparing it to like Colgate. Meaning, I'm in this scenario. I'm saying Colgate is the stronger brand, and if if the Walgreens brand mm-hmm. was cheaper, I would buy the Walgreens brand because I know that it's made of the exact same thing. Another way of asking, what am I not getting about the Supreme hoodie? Okay, so so that's a different question. Mm-hmm. Um, because once you get into the realm of clothing and sh- tennis shoes, the people aren't buying the clothing. They're, they're buying what the clothing represents. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I can't speak to Supreme. I'm not really into that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do understand it from like a Nike perspective. Mm-hmm. So Nike... Um, and if you haven't read Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, who founded Nike, you should. It's an amazing book. It's a page turner. Um, but what Nike did, Nike is not selling you a shoe. Nike is selling you the idea that you can do anything. And that's why you buy the shoe. And by the way, Kanye said this about his own music a couple years ago in an interview. He said, I, when you buy my music, you're buying the medicine. He's like, I am the medicine that, that feels you, that gets you up in the morning and says, I'm going to go do this. Mm. So with the whole Nike universe and the whole just do it universe, that's why people are so obsessed. Same thing with Air Jordan. They're mm. not buying the shoe. They're buying the idea that they could be just like Michael Jordan. Mm. Um, and that's not just true for you know companies like Nike. It's true for, for uh, influencers like Beyonce as well. When people, when women hear the song, you know, who run the world girls, they see their themselves and their potential reflected in that content. And all of this is 
it was for me when I was doing research on different companies. This is probably what you're thinking about what I what I talked about mm. when I was doing research on different companies and sort of like what uh, was a common denominator that connected all these famous brands together. That's what they were doing. They were creating content where their audience saw themselves and their potential reflected in the content, and that is fundamentally enchanting. Mm. And so that's why people wait, you know, at the Apple store. I don't know if they still do it at the Apple store, uh, but that's why people used to wait, you know, in the Apple store in lines. And that's why they do it for Supremes. And I would probably do it for Adidas for the right product. Um, I, I love Nike, but I probably, I would rather like have a Nike deal than wait in line <laughs> for, for a Nike product. Um, but I would, I would consider doing it for like Beyonce, mm -hmm. Ivy Park stuff. Mm -hmm. But but I'm not buying the material in as much as I'm buying the spirit of the material mm. or the the message that the material transmits. And I'm trying to think of something that you would buy, you would you might wait in line for that would reflect the um the spirit of the thing. So interestingly, I there's a lot of artists that I love, mm -hmm. but I intentionally avoid purchasing their merch. I think that's not good, Cole. <laughs> you're not supporting them i buy their yeah. music oh okay i buy their concert tickets <laughs> okay but i don't buy the merch okay why because i think i think i view my relationship with their art as so special that i don't want it represented by something that's mass produced but I you think at a deep level that's probably why but you know that they're not making a lot of money because of streaming services right that's true. and so like they're making a lot of their actual money through the merchandise and the concert tickets. And the so concert I feel like tickets. I but them you, yeah, them. that's, I mean, do you. But would you say most people who buy the merch, they're yeah. not buying it because they know that's how they're supporting the artist, are they? I actually would say, if I were to guess, and I have no idea of knowing this, I haven't researched it, but I would say like the people who buy the merch are actually the more devoted fans. I don't think it's, right. I don't think the merch is being bought by, unless you're talking about Beyonce, right? But, but it's not charity, the reason they're buying it, right? It's. No, it's because. I, it's because they want it. Yeah, I think yeah. it's. But what I'm disagreeing with is your assertion that it's like ma mass produced. I think that the mm -hmm. merch is like probably mostly bought for, by the most devoted fans as opposed oh, to I the see. masses. I see. Yeah. Okay. I think those are the people buying the merch. Like I love Kendrick Lamar. I'm not about to buy right. a Kendrick Lamar t-shirt. Right. Although the, the guy next to me who was crying at his da during his damn tour probably is the kind of guy who's going to buy that. See what right. I'm saying? Right. So, so, so yeah. Even that guy, when I feel like I'm that guy, I want my relationship with their music to be so special and private that I don't want anyone else. I want to have a shirt that is either I, I'm the only one in the world who has it okay. or I don't want it at all. Why? That's a question for me and my therapist, <laughs> or, hypothetically. You don't want to share in this collective experience of, hmm. you know, belonging and... In other contexts, I might, <laughs> sure. but at the concert, I would. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the, well, we grew up in, in an era where a lot of listening to music can be done solo by yeah. oneself in one's headphones, divorced from the world right. in a sense. And it's interesting to fall in love with someone in that context and then go to a concert where everything is now open Okay, and you're sharing the experiences with many people. Um, but perhaps I've been conditioned to, to love music in the first context. And not in the second. And not, and not in the second. Not that I don't love music in a second context, but you see what I'm saying, right? Yeah, it's not, it's not as personal for you. That's right. And the personal is more deeply felt than the collective. Yeah. Although, so this is something to think about. I don't know if you're a spiritual person. I gather that you are to a certain extent. Um, <laughs> this is something to think about. So when it comes to the second piece, it's one of the things I've been fascinated by is the fact that psychologically human beings are willing to stand as close as possible to each other at a concert mm. to human beings they've never met mm -hmm. um to get as close as possible to the stage mm -hmm. i thought that was i've always thought that was so fascinating mm -hmm. um that people are willing to let go of their inhibitions for this one moment and i always wondered like what about the concert experience was producing that and so a couple of years ago i was listening to npr and they were talking about the history of you know when people will chant like ole 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 yeah at like bullfights or even you know other performances or whatever so they're talking about the history of this and then i realized that it's relevant to to this concert 
experience. Mm-hmm. So it turns out that when Spain, well, let me back up. So Spain at some point was under Islamic influence mm-hmm. way, way back in the day. And when folks would go to a concert and they would see an amazing experience, it was like literally witnessing God. Mm. And it would move them so much that they would start chanting the name of God in Arabic, which is Allah. Mm. So they would say Allah, Allah, Allah. And over time, that became ole, ole, ole. Mm. So that's how we have that phrase today. And what I realized from learning that was that the concert experience is a very sacred and spiritual experience. Mm. And it doesn't require one, a spiritual experience does not require one to be alone, right? You can, you can be alone and have a spiritual experience. You can be with the collective and have a spiritual experience, which is like, you know, church or traditional houses of worship, what they're trying to facilitate. And so for me, if I, if I were to sort of like see things from your perspective, and I'm guessing, so please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> But there's something very sacred about like the individual, mm. right? There's something very sacred and dignified and spiritual about the individual. But what I am suggesting to you is that that sacredness doesn't diminish among the collective mm. or with the collective. Um, and in fact, I think this was something that was the, both the, both the individual and the collective and the spiritualness of both experiences in the human condition was something I think that like was very much expressed during the civil rights movement Mm. Um, with a lot of like the freedom songs that were sung and a lot of the different tactics, tactics that were taken with regard to the sit-ins and stuff like that. I think that what was cool about the civil rights movement was like King and all of his various colleagues, what they did was they gave expression to the dignity of the human being in both in the sense of, of the human being as the individual, but also in the sense of the human being being connected to his or her fellow man. Mm. And, I, and I, it may be worth thinking about that dynamic when you think about your experience in a, in a concert and, how, and the beauty of how you are, you are, along with your fellow man, experiencing this amazing, incredible uh, phenomenon mm. in, the, in the concert hall, which I think is both sacred and spiritual and sometimes secular, which is the paradox. All good points. Uh, You asked whether I'm a spiritual person, and that made me think of another area in which I kind of have the same quirk of personality, I'll put it, which is um, I meditate. I do mindfulness meditation, and I've been to several retreats. Cool. And invariably, the teachers on on the retreat who are, are excellent. Yeah. Um, I go to um, the, um, what's it called? Insight Meditation Center okay. in, in Massachusetts. Talk about how, <clears throat> how much better it is, how much more powerful it is to meditate in groups than alone. Okay. I've never understood it, though. Oh, you've never had that experience? Never had the experience okay. of me- med- my meditation in a group being, on average, more powerful, more meaningful than meditation alone. For okay. me, it's just the same. Okay. But most people seem to agree with them. And so yeah, that's interesting. at minimum, it seems like I have a, a coherent personality it's, yeah. <laughs> across the board. Yeah. Well, at least it's equal. Because you said for the concerts, like personal, the personal mm. experience is just better than the collective experience. For you. Well, that's not quite what I meant. Oh, okay. I think um, they're about the same. Actually, with a concert, it's probably a little better because it's live okay. and more <laughs> energetic. Sure. But it's not necessarily the other people there okay. that like, make it better. Interesting. In any event. Um, <laughs> it's now, crazy because I don't really meditate. Like for me, music mm, is my meditation. Mm. Um, I've, try- I've done meditation here and there, but I never, I never like became so passionate about it. Mm. But, but for me, like music and dance are my, my practices in meditation. What kind of dance do you do? Uh, I don't know how you would describe it, but I guess, so Afro beats is like my favorite type of music to mm. dance to. Mm. Um, I get, I feel like really connected to the continent of Africa when I dance the Afro beats, <laughs> uh, like on a, on a visceral level. Like I have had people come up to me and tell me that they thought I was from Africa when mm-hmm. they've seen me dance the Afro beats. So I don't know how you would describe it, but it's, it's, it's dance that's very much in sync with that genre of music. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now this is my actual last question. Okay. 
Uh, do you agree with me that Ch- Chance the Rapper's music has declined? Yes. Why do you think it has? Hmm. Good question. I don't know what he's doing. Like, he went from this very interesting uh, mixture of pop, rap, and spirit, and gospel mm-hmm. to, like... I don't know. What is he doing? Trap music? I don't know. I don't know. It, so, it sounds, I, I just don't recognize anything unique in what he's mm-hmm. producing now as mm-hmm. opposed to his first pieces of work. Mm-hmm. It sounds like noise. Right. What do yeah. you think? I don't know. I'm trying okay. to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. One of my friends said he's, quote, hit chasing. Oh, that's now, good. Which is, which is, Every song, he's trying to get every song to be a hit. Okay, yeah. Or has too many hands in the pot, too many producers on each track, oh. saturating each each song with, it's like like putting sugar, and a lot of sugar and a lot of salt in the same thing because you think it's going to taste good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, you need to take away most of right. that and go back to simplicity and right. like, trying so hard. Interesting. Alternative theory is that ever since he had a baby, Something has changed about him as a person. <laughs> really? I don't know. I don't think that's it. I don't think that's it. Cause like when he produced that song, "May I Have This Dance" with uh, uh, Francis and the Lights, which was you know for him, I think a, a love letter to his daughter. Mm-hmm. I think that was that was like quintessentially mm-hmm. Chance the Rapper. Mm-hmm. That was like p- powerful Chance the Rapper, and Chance the Rapper in his prime. But um, I don't know. Have you seen Rhythm and Flow? The no. show on Netflix? No, I still haven't. I've heard it's good. So good. Yeah. So I don't know where he's going as an artist, but as a judge, um, it's one of the best shows on Netflix. Uh, so be sure to check it out. And maybe that'll inspire him to make better music. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you tell people where to find you before we wrap up? Yes. I am on Twitter primarily at C Valdery, V A L D A R Y is how you spell my last name. And also follow Theory of Enchantment. Uh, also check out the Theory of Enchantment podcast on iTunes and other plat- platforms available. You can check out my music on SoundCloud under the moniker Beats Beats by Paradox. Um, and I hope to be producing more music soon. I've been I hit a lull with work and stuff, but I I hope to be producing more of that. So feel free to reach out or uh, for conversation or chit chat if if people want to. Awesome. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you. Thank you.